much anticipated cyclical on the environment, uh, Laudante C, which is about to be released. Got leaked out a little bit first, there was a bit of a controversy over the draft, uh, but then soon after, a few days later, uh, the official text uh, came out. The title, Laudante C, so the English translation version is uh, uh, on the care of our common environment. So it's a pretty exciting topical issue, no doubt, for, for many of us. Our previous former Archbishop of Sydney, Cardinal Pell, has weighed in on the topic uh, very much when he was Archbishop of Sydney, and also recently, which may have seen in the video. So we're excited that tonight, uh, this uh, doorstopper of the cyclical, it's really about over a couple of hundred pages long, uh, is going to be sort of broken down and made a little bit clearer for us by a wonderful friend of Theology on Tap. Uh, uh, many of us know him here. He's spoken at Theology on Tap many times. Peter Holmes, lecturer at Notre Dame. University, greatest Catholic university in the country. Uh, he, uh, his main background is in scripture and theology, but he has lectured and given many presentations extensively in areas of relationships, uh, masculinity and femininity, and evangelization. So we're very lucky to have him here again tonight, talking on the Pope's uh, encyclical. The title we would have known from uh, tonight's talk is developed from Al Gore's 2006 documentary, which caused a bit of a stir, so I'm sure Peter might be able to continue in that same legacy tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Holmes. Now, Pat's given me um, roughly 20 minutes to summarize a 40,000 word document. So, I've, I've calculated this, it's going to take 2,000 words a minute, roughly 33 words a second. Mercifully, I'm going to cut it short. You, um, you might be wondering what a scripture scholar or somebody who's studying masculinity for a PhD is doing talking about the environment. I came to it because my father raised me to care about nature. I grew up on a hobby farm, not a real farm, but just sort of a 10 acre hobby farm, where we went bushwalking in heat. When my father broke out his um, slides, the old slides they used to, before we had digital cameras, he had one set of slides on our family, so maybe a thousand pictures of our family from our whole um, upbringing, and he had three on sunsets. Um, three whole cases, three whole cases on flowers, on birds, so you can tell he was a bit of a fanatic about nature. He basically taught us to look up, look, to care about nature, but one of the biggest disappointments I've had in my adult life is as soon as I got to be old enough to think about these things and get political, Almost anybody who claimed to be representing green things or ecology um, spent most of their time attacking Christianity and not actually doing anything green. So I'm, I was very interested when Pope Francis decided to come out and say something clear and concise, well, not concise at all, actually, <laughs> clear and um, uh, unequivocal about um, ecology. One of the things that's going around in the media, though, is this kind of pretend story that Pope Francis has finally breached the gap. He's finally come out and spoken about ecology. He's bringing the Catholic Church up to date, they say. He's finally coming on board with what everyone else has been saying for a long time. And I've had this scoffing attitude from friends. But in fact, it's not the case. Pope Francis himself, in the document, cites no fewer than six previous popes who have spoken on this matter before him. Now, you can go back further than that, um, but I'm going to stick with what he said. Pope Leo XIII in 1891 was already saying that the mark we leave on the land is a, is a moral issue. Not just for work, not just in terms of our creativity, but the mark we leave on the land, how we leave it for the next generation, is a moral issue. Pope Pius XI in 1931 said that the economic abuse of the land and specifically hoarding of resources by one small group of people at the expense of everybody else not only destroys the land but it destroys the social uh, ecology. He doesn't use that term but that's what he meant, the social um, life, the family life of many. 
John the 23rd, in 1961, made the point that greed is killing society. The greed that just keeps exploiting resources ruthlessly, where money is the object, is killing society, killing families, and specifically harming the poor and their environment. The same Pope, John the 23rd in 1963, talked about the nuclear arms race in terms of its damage on the environment, potential damage, even the testing of it, and basically said that war, or even the threat of war, or any kind of such thing is no excuse to be damaging God's creation. In Vatican II in 1965, Gaudium at Space talked about the proper use of creation, the proper distribution of sources for all people and the care of God's um, creation. Paul VI, the ninth, oh, this is getting boring, isn't it? 1967, <laughs> said that if we completely abandon any kind of moral framework for our, our use of natural resources, we lose sight of who we are or who God's made us to be. John, um, John Paul II, in two separate encyclicals, talked about ecological conversion, a need for ecological conversion, actually taking responsibility for how we treat the resources God has given us. Responsibility is the key term. Um, I'm skipping over a lot because we only have a certain amount of time. John Paul II in, in specifically encouraged us in 2001 to support and push for ecological conversion, not only of Catholics, but of the whole world. What did he mean by this? He said, in recent, he wants to support ecological conversion, in recent decades has made humanity more sensitive to the catastrophe towards which it is heading. Man is no longer the creator's steward, but an autonomous despot, meaning dictator who doesn't care who is finally beginning to understand that he must stop at the edge of this abyss. That's in 2001. Pope Benedict came out quite clearly and said that we need to actually look for correct models of growing our technology, our society, our businesses, which respect both creation and the people involved, the, the human ecology. He specifically uses that term our human ecology. When human ecology is respected within society, environmental ecology naturally follows. So Benedict turned it on its head and said, when we respect human beings and the family and the proper respect for every human being, we actually start to care about the environment because we all live in it. When we don't care about other people and we only care about wealth, there's a tendency to exploit the environment to the point where other people suffer. So Pope Francis is far from a new story in this regard. He just happens to have brought it all together and a bit more in terms of um, putting it all into one document. I remember reading it. I re took about four or five hours to read it in the night it came out. And as I was reading through it, I said to my wife after a couple of hours, I wonder if there's a Catholic doctrine he doesn't talk about in this document. Because he dealt with everything. He's put everything together. One of the things that happened almost immediately, you may have noticed, is almost immediately the internet exploded with reactions. They exploded to say, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's a heretic, he's completely left wing, or, see, we told you right wingers. Yeah, so in other words, they made it a political thing. Now Pope Francis has, in good grace, simply ignored most of the responses, but gently corrected some of them. Tonight I was wondering, how many people, every other time I open my mouth and talk about ecology, most people assume I'm in favour of a particular political party. Um, they usually give up on trying to get me to vote for them when I turn up with my eight children. But, um, <laughs> so I was going to cheekily call tonight's uh, talk the top ten reasons why Pope Francis won't be joining the Australian Greens. However, what I'm trying to do here is distinguish what we're talking about here between a genuine ecology, and by that I mean a Catholic ecology, and a political movement. One of the problems in the past with movements that protest things is that they get so caught up with what they're protesting that they forget what they're protecting. G.K. Chesterton, that Catholic wise man, once quipped, 
But the problem with protesters, and he was talking about Protestants at the time, but protesters in general, is that they're usually right about what is wrong, but wrong about what is right. You get the point? They're usually right about what is wrong. People rightly say, we're doing damage to the earth. We are, pollution is bad. I mean, if, you, if I come to your house and throw rubbish on the floor, you, you get understandably upset. It's bad to mess up your home. It's a bad idea. But the solutions offered by these particular agitation groups usually are disastrous, or would be disastrous if anyone actually took them seriously. G.K. Chesterton again said of Protestantism, but also of all protest movements, what tends to come out of that is emphasis and nothing but emphasis. They take one thing and say, this thing is important, and most of the time they're right, it is important. But they take that one thing and almost forget about everything else. It is important that trees are looked after. It is important that we have a, a solid ecology. It is important that our air stays of good quality, that our seas aren't polluted, that all those things happen. It is important. But it's not the only thing that matters. We have a place in that ecology, the human ecology, the human family, the whole of human life. We were actually, this stuff was built so we could stand on it. This earth was put here so that we could be here. Even if we take a pure natural law approach, there is actually a better future for an earth where there's a diligent, intelligent response to damage to maintaining the balance in nature than it is if we just go and do what one green person, admittedly they are slightly more extreme than usual, but they said that the best thing I could do as a human was to decompose softly under a tree. The difference with Catholic approach to ecology is it doesn't stop with trees. It extends into the entire order of God's creation, which includes humans, which includes all kinds of things, such as the moral sphere. And in fact, Francis makes a claim very early in the document, in only in paragraph 9, I know most people didn't read this, this document at all, because it's only in paragraph 9 that Francis says, you will not solve this problem with science. You will not solve it with science. Why? Because it's a spiritual problem. And the problem is greed. The problem is that we're selfish and we're looking only for what we get out of it in the short term. And he says the problem is that institutionally, nationally and personally, when we need to get used to being satisfied with what we have with something simple, with something that is good for us but not excessive, the grasping after more, the constant culture of greed is actually damaging our families and the earth we live in. Now, he says that in paragraph 9, so if anyone's read to that point, they'd realise this is not just an advocate, he's not just an advocate of global warming or something like that. He's putting forward a position that's completely different from things we've heard so far. The scope here is eternal. It's not just about this earth, but it's talking about the next life. He's saying that we will answer to God for the way we treat God's gifts. Look in the Gospels. God gives, Jesus tells a parable of the talents. He gives people a certain amount of talents, and what some of them use it to good effect. They use it for what it's for, and they gather good things from it, good fruits. But the ones who misuse it or simply neglect it are punished. One of the first and foremost things you're given is life, and that life is sustained and premised upon the fact that you're standing on an earth. It has an ecology, it's the home in which you live. And one of the things, not all of them, but one of the things that we'll be judged on is how well we were stewards of that gift. There is an uncomfortable, so sorry, as a Catholic, I'm very comfortable with this document because he doesn't back away from any part of Catholic doctrine. In fact, what he says to the ecologists is, I'm not catching up with you, you need to catch up with me. Francis says, come on, I dare you to be complete in your ecology. I dare you to go beyond just looking at flowers and trees and come out and look at the whole of God's creation and the order of things and actually look at a human ecology, which you seem to be denying. Come out and look at the way everything works. 
But one thing that is uncomfortable about Francis as a technical is that he singles out cultures which are richer than most other cultures in the world. I remember um, seeing a chart, I don't know how accurate this is by the way, but it's, I'm told that it's accurate enough for an analogy. Seeing a chart that said, if there were 100 people in the world, how many do you think would own a computer? One. How many do you think would own a car? One. How many think you can go on this list for a long while and it always comes down to one or less than one out of a hundred people? Now, I have two cars because I have eight children that don't fit in one car. And I have four computers because we're homeschooling and they can't all be on the computer at once. That makes me not just in the top bracket, but really solidly in the top bracket. Now, if you do all the calculations according to the tax office, and you take off what children are supposed to cost me, I'm actually pretty close to the poverty line, the poverty line in Australia. Think about that. I'm technically close to poverty, theoretically, in Australia, and yet I'm still in the top 1%, at least, in the world. There is an uncomfortable part of this encyclical, and that is because it calls us to account into how we use resources. Pope Francis makes a statement which I had to go and check because I thought, surely this can't be true. He said, if all of us, if the whole world, if every human being in the whole world lived like they, we do in a Western country, so if they just threw out as much trash as I throw out, used as much whatever as I do, if the whole world did that, we would be done in a year. There would be so much crap in the world we would destroy. The lifestyle we're living is actually unsustainable for more than just the tiny percentage of people who are rich enough to live it. Think about, now this may be so uncomfortable as a person, I had to go and check up some of these things, but think about where our labor's going. Where's everyone going in industry? If, you, if you're in industry and you're going, you can't really manufacture in Australia anymore economically, you have to go to China, which is the worst ecological disaster in terms of the industrial revolution in this country. China, okay? We're, and all of our offshore stuff that we keep going, oh, let's go cheaper, cheaper, putting stuff offshore, you go to those countries and find out what's happening there, but basically back into colonialism, into a form of basically using cheap labor, cheap stuff from other countries at their expense. At their expense. Now, Francis doesn't lay the blame as if I'm suddenly killing people just by having an iPhone or something like that. But what he does do is call us to a spiritual change. He says this is not a pure case of if I buy this, I've done this, but he's talking about a spirituality of simplicity. He calls us to think through what we're doing in the, on the basis of, are we doing this because we must, as in it's good for our family, it's good for... Uh, education, those sorts of things, or are we doing it just because someone else has got one of these and I want one? Or is it simply just because the whole of society seems caught up in this race to get as much as possible? He calls, calls out this whole idea of progress, and he says everyone keeps saying Catholics get in the way of progress, whatever that means. And he asks the question, progress towards what? You should ask that question. If someone says progress, you go, towards what? Because progress indicates movement in a direction. And you have to ask, there's no point in progress unless it has a goal, unless it actually has something as a goal. And if human beings and the treatment of human beings, or even of the environment, is getting in the way of progress, you've got to wonder what's the goal. If human beings and the environment can be expendable in terms of this progress, what, what else is there to gain? He's not calling out the whole society as if we're evil. He's calling us to think, to be genuinely moral in our choices, to be genuinely considerate, to actually step back and say, do I really need this? Or can I live more simply? And we're not talking about bread and water here. He's talking about a genuine, genuine simplicity in our understanding and appreciation of God's creation. Now, this brings me, because I have to finish now, 
briefly to the summary of what he's saying. It's not just a guilt trip, because about the first half of the document, 20,000 words or so, is telling us off. But then he turns around, about paragraph 50, he says, now here's the problem. There's an inadequate response from even the people who are very excited about this, come out with ideas such as, we need more birth control. He says, stopping poor people from reproducing is not the answer. We can actually have as, probably twice as many people as we've got on this earth at least and still comfortably feed them with our current technology, let alone anything we can develop, provided we share in an appropriate way. He talks about a variety of failed responses of various governments because they're playing political games rather than actually trying to do something about it. Solutions to this problem are unpopular, especially in democratic societies, because it's going to cost me. I will actually have to not, perhaps, have that fourth computer or the third or the second. He talks about, and this is the key to the whole document, in the second half of the document, he talks about a spirituality that is related to St. Francis himself. And what's that spirituality? The spirituality is an attitude that begins with respect for the God who gave us the gift. Respect for the God, and then respect for the gift itself. It begins with respect. It develops into responsibility to nurture. Our responsibility is not just to sit and watch creation, but to actually be actively involved, as Adam was in the garden, as in that um, analogy of our whole human life. Adam was in the garden, as all of mankind has been required to be all along, that we are involved in bringing God's order as the regent of creation to creation. We're responsible for it. But beyond that responsibility, he wants us to move into wonder, humility before God's greatest So when we look at creation, we don't just go, there's another job for me today. We actually look and wonder at God's majesty. That's my cracking time to tell me I'm up. We look at God's creation and wonder how awesome God is that we actually stand before him humble because how many sunsets have you made today? How many flowers could you make even if you had all the time in the world? These things, even the smallest thing, it sounds really trite to say stop and smell the roses, but literally that's what Francis is saying. Take time out to actually look at what God's done for us. We take it for granted. Take time out to stand before God in humility and wonder at his creation. Now, that wonder brings us to what seems to have been the hallmark of St. Francis's whole pontificate, and that is that he wants us to come with St. Francis himself, the original, to joy. He wants us to look at creation and not see despair, as, and this is what the problem is with most ecological movements. They look at it and go, oh, everything's going to hell, we're going to die, everything's wrecked. He told us to look at creation and take joy in it. Joy because it's a wonderful gift. Responsibility, yes, but joy. That Almighty God has given us such a precious and wonderful thing. And finally, that that joy then evokes us to love. That we see how much God has lavished on us, that we in turn want to lavish our creativity, our energy, our skills, our creation, our participation in creation. We want to give that up for other people. We want to give other people the benefit of our participation in creation. So all the skills that we have, all the time, the effort, the resources, and our resources are considerable, we give them for the good of others. And when and he, his primary way of doing this is to be families, to be joyful, genuine Catholic families, but also he's talking to the whole world, be genuinely joyful families and raise people to love and be excited about God's gifts and cherish them and care for them. So yes, we are actually responsible for caring for them. And no, we shouldn't just callously use them, exploit them for our riches. But we don't do it out of guilt or shame or some sort of sense of dread, but out of a sense of wonder and joy. Francis helps us to see through all of the guff out there, which seems to be, a lot of it seems to be directed against religious people, in particular Catholics, and see that we, they may 
be the ones loudest at the moment, but we actually started this trend. Catholics were concerned about ecology long before anyone else was, and we're likely to be still concerned about it long after anybody else is. We need to keep on quietly going about our way, humbly before God and his creation, wondering in his creation, and asking him for the good sense to do what's good for his creation and for ourselves. Done.